When suffering from diarrhea, a visit to the doctor can be useful. The doctor will prescribe you with the necessary antibiotics to kill the bacteria that is infecting your digestive system. At the same time, the doctor will prescribe you a sachet containing oral rehydration sauce known as ORS. If we look at the content of this sachet, you will find there is sodium chloride as well as potassium chloride, the salts that are necessary in our system. In today's bio world, I will discuss how sodium and potassium are regulated and explain why the doctor prescribes this to us when we have diarrhea. In our STPM syllabus, the concentration of sodium and potassium is regulated by the hormone aldosterone. Even this hormone follows the sequence of stimulus, receptor, control center, effector, and response. So let's begin. The stimulus is related to the loss of both sodium and potassium from our blood. This can occur during diarrhea, bleeding, or even vomiting. When we bleed, there is loss of blood, which directly relates to the loss of sodium and potassium. When we are having diarrhea or we are vomiting, there is no loss of blood, but the sodium and potassium is released with the diarrhea as well as with the vomit. This causes our tissue fluids to lose sodium and potassium and the sodium and potassium will then be replaced from blood. So eventually, blood osmolarity decreases. The decrease in the blood osmolarity will be detected by a chemoreceptor. This chemoreceptor detects the decrease that was caused by the loss of sodium. Do not mistaken with the chemoreceptor that detects decrease in blood osmolarity due to excess water. I have discussed the regulation of water and the chemoreceptor involved, which is the hypothalamus, in my video on osmoregulation part 1. You can view this video to take note of the difference. Now, this chemoreceptor is not located in the brain. Instead, it is located in the kidney at the glomerulus of the nephron. If we have a closer look at the glomerulus, you are well aware that it is the afferent arteriole that transports blood into the glomerulus and the blood will exit out of the efferent arteriole. It is at the afferent arteriole where you find the chemoreceptor called JGA. JGA stands for Juxta Glomerular Apparatus. So JGA will detect the decrease in blood osmolarity that is caused due to the loss of sodium. Just as how the receptor is not located in the brain but in the kidney, so too is the control center. In fact, for this mechanism, there is more than one control center. The first is the kidney itself. JGA, upon detecting the decrease in the blood osmolarity, will stimulate the kidney to synthesize and secrete a protein called renin. Do not mistaken this protein with renin double N, which is a digestive enzyme found in our stomach which coagulates milk. Now this renin will then be transported 
to the second control center that is the liver. Since the liver carries out multiple metabolic processes, the liver will use this renin to convert a protein known as angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Then, Angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by an enzyme present in the liver called ACE. Angiotensin converting enzyme. The angiotensin 2 then will be transported to specific effectors. Angiotensin 2 will be transported by blood to the specific effectors. First effector is the kidney. Above the kidney, there is the adrenal gland. Angiotensin II will stimulate activity of the adrenal gland. Angiotensin II will also enter inside the kidney, where angiotensin II will cause an effect to the afferent arteriole. Besides the kidney, the other effector is the intestine. When angiotensin II arrives at the intestine, it also will affect intestine activities. Let me now explain the detailed response of each effector to the presence of angiotensin II. When angiotensin II arrives at the adrenal gland, it will stimulate the adrenal gland to secrete more aldosterone. The hormone aldosterone's target organ is the kidney, specifically at the distal convoluted tubules and collecting duct of the nephron. To give a more detailed explanation, I shall use this rectangle to represent the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. Now the tubule and the duct will gather sodium iodes to excrete it along with urine. But the present situation is that the blood capillaries do not have sufficient sodium ion. So what happens now is that the aldosterone will bind to the cells of the tubules, making the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct increase their permeability to sodium ions. So what happens next is the sodium ions will diffuse into the peritubular capillaries. So more sodium ion will be reabsorbed into the peritubular capillaries. So this way the blood osmolarity increases back to normal. And since the sodium ions have diffused into the blood, the urine that forms will be dilute. However, the transport of the sodium ion is complementary to the transport of potassium ions. So as the sodium ions are reabsorbed into the peritubular capillaries, the potassium ion that is in the blood will be excreted into the distal convoluted tubules and collecting duct so that they can be removed along with the urine. Before I explain the response at the glomerulus in the presence of angiotensin II, let me refresh you about what normally happens at the glomerulus. Blood traveling into the glomerulus will contain sodium ions, but because the afferent arteriole's diameter is larger than the efferent arteriole's diameter, a high hydrostatic pressure forms, causing ultrafiltration to occur. So the sodium ions that was in the blood will be forced out into the Bowman's capsule and later excreted along with urine. But the situation now is that the blood does not have enough sodium. So it cannot waste the little bit of sodium that it already has. So what angiotensin II will do 
is it will cause the afferent arteriole to vasoconstrict. The diameter of the arteriole will decrease. In this way, the hydrostatic pressure at the glomerulus decreases, causing less ultrafiltration to occur. So in this way, less sodium is forced out of the blood. Sodium can be maintained in the blood. Now, I'll talk about the response of the intestines towards angiotensin 2. At the beginning of the video, I introduced the oral rehydration salts. When we consume these salts, our intestines will contain sodium ion. Usually, the sodium ion will be excreted along with the feces. But now, since our blood requires the sodium ion, Angiotensin II will stimulate the absorption of sodium ion from the intestines into the blood. So this way, the blood's osmolarity can be increased to normal. But that doesn't mean we can keep on taking too much salt because excess salt will increase our blood osmolarity. So now, let's look at what happens if the stimulus is too much salt. Just a reminder, when the blood osmolarity decreased due to loss of sodium ion, the chemoreceptor was located in the kidney at the nephron it was called the juxta glomerular apparatus. However, when the blood osmolarity increases due to presence of sodium ions, the receptor is located in a completely different organ. Believe it or not, it is located in the heart. The receptor is actually the heart atrium. When the heart atrium detects increase in blood osmolarity, the atrium itself will begin to secrete a protein called ANP, arterial natriuretic peptide. ANP will inhibit renin as well as aldosterone. When ANP inhibits renin, the whole angiotensinogen pathway in the liver is inhibited too. Without renin, angiotensinogen cannot be converted into angiotensin 1. And without angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2 cannot be produced. Now earlier in the video, I have introduced to you the importance of angiotensin 2. Firstly, angiotensin II is necessary to stimulate the adrenal gland to secrete more aldosterone. But now, without angiotensin II, adrenal gland cannot be stimulated. So, less aldosterone will be secreted. However, ANP also inhibits aldosterone. So, the little bit of aldosterone that is being secreted will become inactive. Because of that, the distal convoluted tube and the collecting duct of the nephron will remain impermeable to sodium ions. In this way, the excess sodium ions can be excreted through urine. The second role of angiotensin II is to promote vasoconstriction at the glomerulus. The objective is to maintain the sodium ions within the blood vessels. But now, without angiotensin II, vasoconstriction will not happen. The afferent arteriole will have a larger diameter than the efferent arteriole. So because of that, 
ultra filtration will occur at a normal rate so that the excess sodium ions can be forced out of the blood vessels into the nephron and excreted with urine. The third role of angiotensin II was to promote sodium ion absorption from the intestines into the blood. But now, without angiotensin II, sodium ion absorption will not occur. So in this way, less sodium will enter the intestine. The excess sodium will be excreted along with feces. To conclude, I will do a quick summary of today's content. In today's video, we learned that blood osmolarity can be affected by the sodium ion in our blood. When there is excessive blood loss, diarrhea or vomiting, there is loss of sodium ions in our blood leading to a decrease in blood osmolarity. So in today's video, we learned about processes that help to increase entry of sodium ions into blood so that our blood osmolarity can increase returning to normal. We also learned that if we have a high sodium diet, the blood osmolarity can increase. And in this video, we discussed how our body can decrease the blood osmolarity to return to normal by reducing entry of sodium ions into blood. So with that, I conclude today's lesson. Bye-bye.